for those of you who haven't had a chance because it is probably one of the most beautiful, magical settings in the whole world. It is right on the beach, and it's Jericho Beach. Um, I'm actually kind of jealous on the, on the night performances uh, for the artists who get to watch the sunset as it goes over the mountain and into the ocean, and you get to look out over all of these glowing faces. It's just a magical setting with magical people, and... I, um, have I sold it enough for you yet? Or is it, yeah. Honestly, just the, the, the beach and the sunset, yeah. Like, I'm in. Everything that you just mm-hmm. said is like, that sounds like the place I'd rather be instead of the icy tundra I currently exist in. But that's fine. <laughs> yes. Naomi, uh, I've heard that you've been going to this festival your entire life, literally. Could you tell us about your family's history with this festival? Yeah, so in July of 1983, my parents got married at Brock House at Jericho Beach, and then they went right back to the Folk Fest after the ceremony and the reception. And then in November of 1983, I was born. So effectively, I've been going to the Folk Fest since before I was born. It was a staple of my childhood, my young adulthood, my adulthood. Um, I've gone almost every year, and it is just precious to me and my family and my friends. I love that word, precious, because it implies like this like deeply emotional, really personal relationship with the event, with the fact that you sort of keep recurring every year, and like, that's the place that you go, and you go, like, this, is, this is the mainstay of my calendar, you know what I mean? That's what it sounds like for you, Naomi. It's absolutely a mainstay of my calendar. It's also been really critical in the development of my appreciation for music, my appreciation for uh, progressive politics, for uh, being in a setting with so many generations of people. Um, It's when I look back on the years, the Folk Fest has just been really instrumental in forming who I am as a person today. Lisa, I heard you um, say, oh, yeah. say talking to agreement there, but speci- specifically about the idea of like a festival introducing a set of politics to your life. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also a safe space to go and enjoy music. I mean, yeah. we hear a lot of horror stories about, uh, you know, especially for, for women uh, to go. And there was a space where children could go. And I think that's, you know, a large part of what the folk festival environment is like and why it is uh, so important and crucial to music and to culture. I, so, Lisa, let's talk a little bit about the last couple of years because, sure, the, the, fe- the festival had to shut down for COVID, um, but it had a huge comeback, right? It came back mm-hmm. last year, New- Newport Art was played, Allison Russell played, and then at the time, the organizers said the ticket sales like passed the expectations that they had, and then we get to January of this year, and they say, you know what, I'm not coming back in 2023. I think everybody's wondering, what happened? Yeah, it was quite alarming uh, to hear the festival society say that they needed an extra five hundred thousand dollars to produce the festival this summer. Wow. Uh, they said it was unfortunately not realistic or sustainable with its current cash flow. Things have changed since COVID, and uh, something I think was quite interesting for a lot of uh, people to learn, and, and turns out to be a problem for a lot of festivals. Um, is that the festival president said, for example, many of our vendors now require payment up front which our cash flow does not allow for. So it's really getting a peek into the books, which do not look good. Uh, it's not even just this year's event, because I think that would be one thing, Naomi, if they said, okay, we got to take a year off to regroup. But some of the story that we're hearing is that the, the society that organizes this festival said they're going to vote next month um, to decide whether they have to dissolve the entire organization, which could mean, I guess, the end of this festival as we know it for good. When you heard that, what was your reaction on first? I was absolutely shocked and horrified and um, really surprised that this was the first that we, the donors, the members, the supporters, the attendees, were hearing about it. Um, We know that the festival has struggled financially in the past, but on every occasion where there has been a real shortfall, they've reached out at the earliest possible moment to so it didn't come totally out of the blue. I did see that it was a scaled down event um, last summer, but there really wasn't an explanation that indicated they were in financial trouble and that they needed help and that they needed to to mobilize people to do something about it. I mean, the prospect of it never happening again, um, that's just that's just incredibly sad. 
morning, but last night the society hosted this town hall where community members talked about how they might save the festival before the vote. You were there. How hopeful are you feeling today um, having witnessed that? Well, I will say that um, it was a challenging meeting on a lot of levels. I'm trying to maintain a level of hope this morning. I think that much will depend on whether the board can go from a place of being determined that a resolution to dissolve the society was needed to actually really openly considering the proposals to save it, to think creatively about it, because it's very difficult for the same to you um, on this beyond what this event means to you personally how would you characterize losing the vancouver music festival what would that mean do you think to the city as a whole the festival is really the only event of its kind that exists in vancouver and it has such a long history <laughs> it's not a festival that has just um you know come up spontaneously over the last few years 45 years of history is longer than i've been alive and so for something with that that history and track record to disappear from the summer landscape would be quite devastating there isn't anything else that's like it and when i see um other events being planned or contemplated that are on a, a much larger scale like the olympics for instance um you know major concert series I think to myself that this is an event that has a, a really established track record of people wanting to be there year after year after year. Yeah. And to lose it, I don't see it being replaced by anything of its kind ever again. Mm -hmm. And that would be a tremendous loss, not just for music, but also um, for culture, for community, for political organizing. Mm -hmm. And for people of all ages. Well, uh, perhaps somewhat selfishly, because I would like to experience these stages and the sun going down on the beach as the music plays, I really hope that the Vancouver Folk Music Festival continues and lives on for many more years. I'm hopeful that I can make it out there someday. But uh, Naomi, Lisa, I really appreciate you being here. My pleasure. Naomi Moses has been going to the Vancouver Folk Music Festival her whole life. Lisa Christensen is a CBC Arts reporter in Vancouver.
these 41 weeks and then the yeah. editor paid you out of his own pocket? Yes. <laughs> so um, the last, I, I do want to clarify, I, Now Magazine is somewhere that I actually got my start at as a writer about 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, I wrote uh, a cultural piece for them and I think it's a little bit special that, you know, I, the last, the first, the first time was my, it was my be- the beginning for me as a writer and the last time was shortly before uh, it was announced that now maybe we would be continuing. Uh, but Rad reached out to me to write a piece uh, about the two my daughters, Dixon Play. That's Rad Simon Play, who's uh, the editor of Now, yeah? Yes, yes. exactly. Uh, and she made it very clear to me at that point that um, there were some sort of issues going on behind the scenes. I didn't fully understand it at the time, but he made it clear that I would not be receiving uh my pay in time. And what he ended up doing was actually paying me out of his own pocket, uh, which when an editor makes personal sacrifices, like paying out of their own pocket to ensure that contributors contributors are receiving their money, mm-hmm. I think it demonstrates just how committed they are to maintaining the life and spirit of the publication. So uh, we only got about a minute left here, but this is obviously a difficult thing to navigate, right? Because you have a new owner coming in and not necessarily having to be responsible for the old back pay, um, but there is a legacy mm-hmm. to uphold. There are people who worked for that magazine who are not going to be paid um, the, the, the money that they are owed. How do you navigate this and how do you think about what Brandon is going to do with the now legacy? Brendan to maintain that Now Legacy completely. Um, I think as Rad and other writers for Now Magazine have kind of hinted at, that legacy might be gone. But I do hope that he revitalized it to something new that might have some sort of uh, strings or, ta- or connections to that previous legacy. We know that Toronto is a hub for Black artists and creatives in the city. Uh, there has never really been an online space to really address that. And I wouldn't even say this is reserved for the black community. Cultural reporting is really at, um, at, at really a difficult, difficult location across the continent right now. So I'm hoping that he utilizes this on, online space to maintain uh, that the essence of now's commitment to the arts community, to the cultural communities of, of, this, of, of the city. Uh, and I'm really hoping that he, he uses now Toronto, not just for an outlet for viral stories, but uh, really demonstrate demonstrating the, the, the vibrancy of, of culture happening here. I love that. Uh, Huda Hassan, thank you so much. I appreciate your thoughts on this. Thank you for having me. Huda Hassan writes a monthly column for CBC Arts called Against the Grain. You can read her entire piece on Brandon Gomez and the future of now at cbc.ca slash arts. That is a commotion for today. Tomorrow, we wrap up this whole week with this really big story. Beyonce announced her brand new tour. I am preparing myself mentally and physically for the Ticketmaster Hunger Games. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about how Gawker has been shut down again. All of that and more on Commotion tomorrow. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. Why don't we do this again tomorrow? From the CBC Vancouver Newsroom, I'm Tim Weeks. Police have laid dozens of new charges against a care aide accused of defrauding elderly victims. Anna Marie Chomdahl was accused last June of taking a wallet from a 96-year-old man and using his credit and debit cards. Police say they've identified more victims since then. Chomdahl now faces 65 charges from fraud to possession of forged documents in relation to 19 victims. She remains in custody until her next court date. Vancouver is asking the public for reaction to a plan to allow triplexes and other multiplexes right across the city. Officials are holding a series of open houses to gauge input. They say the goal is to increase the number of housing options and provide a wider range of home ownership models. Feedback will help shape draft recommendations on what's being called the missing middle options and will be reported to City Council later this year. The RCMP say poor weather and poor road conditions are to blame for a fatal crash between Terrace and Prince Rupert. Witnesses noticed tracks leading from Highway 16 into the Skeena River. Two people at the scene and an RCMP officer managed to pull the vehicle out of the water and rescue the driver, but a 33-year-old woman did not survive. (coughs) Police are urging drivers to use extreme caution when driving in those conditions. 
In the forecast, mostly cloudy today with a high of 8. The rain returns tomorrow with a high of 9. literature, and they instilled a love of poetry in young Bernard. While at the newspaper, Bernard flirted with becoming a journalist, but soon left that job and drifted with friends, drinking, shooting pool, and, because he loved music, going to dance halls. Then one day in 1967, Bernard spotted an ad in the New Musical Express, a British music newspaper. The ad had been placed by Liberty Records. They had a job opening for a songwriter. So Bernard stuffed a handful of poems he had written into an envelope and mailed it to the record company. Meanwhile, a 23-year-old named Reg was kicking around London. He had been a bit of a child prodigy, able to pick out melodies on the piano at three years of age. That talent got him a scholarship at the Royal Academy of Music at the age of 11. While he had a difficult relationship with his father, both parents were musically inclined and were avid record buyers. When his mother brought home a record by Elvis, Reg was hooked on rock and roll. At the age of 17, he formed a blues band, but what he wanted to do most of all was write music for other performers. Then, one day in 1967, he spotted an ad in the new Musical Express. The ad had been placed by Liberty Records. They had a job opening for a songwriter. So Reg stuffed a bunch of songs he had been composing into an envelope and dropped it off at the record company. Liberty Records saw something in Reg. They wanted him to start writing songs for their stable of artists. Except it was one problem. Music came easily to Reg, but lyrics did not. So the Liberty Records executive reached into a pile of envelopes from lyric writers, randomly pulled one out, and gave it to Reg. On the tube ride home that night, Reg opened the envelope and began reading the poetry inside. They were written by someone named Bernard, and they were pretty good. So Reg set some of the poetry to his music and mailed the results to Bernard. They continued writing long distance in two separate towns until they finally met six months later. Not long after, Reg and Bernard were hired as staff writers by music publisher Dick James to compose material for various artists. It was a big opportunity 